are coming in. I'm, I'm glad to be there to help them get started in the business also, because we have several projects that are we working on, and we're trying to, what we're trying to do is change people's lives with each stitch that we make. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Marcus Henry. Mr. Henry. Good evening. My name is Marcus Henry. I am thankful for our New Life Center, St. Luke New Life Center. You know, uh, my unemployment was about ready to run out. I came up there and volunteered, and I just kept volunteering for like three or four months. And all of a sudden, it came with the program, and I graduated from the program. I haven't been there. For, it's, it's a while now, so. I, I'm just thankful and grateful for them, though, because they help so many fellows that's all less fortunate. My unemployment was about ready to run out, and I ended up getting a job. I ended up starting working four days before my unemployment ran out. I wish the emergency manager could have stayed here because, and the mayor, because they really need to hear this also, you know, instead of walking off on people. I think that is very rude because they need to hear about what St. Luke New Life Center done. You know, I'm sitting here listening to all the ladies and gentlemen on the council on the board, listen to each and every one of y'all, and all y'all had some good points, see, but uh, body language tell a lot, and uh, I, when I know how to read body language, and they ain't for the right thing, so, cause they ain't getting St. Luke no grants when they come to them a couple years ago, last year, this year, they asked for a grant, and this is a program that's taking people off the street, giving them jobs, helping them get GEDs, give them food, uh, got uh, computer classes, got domestic violence classes. I mean, this is helping the community. I'm finna cut all these bushes down around here, trying to get a new program started for the men. I mean, this is what we're supposed to be doing for the city. We're supposed to be trying to help each other uplift it. To me, it seems like they, they don't care. They go back to Nancy or wherever they at, and they big fancy homes. Their taxes ain't going up. Look, my tax is high. I'm a, I, I, I stay by myself. My water bill, $137. I don't even be home. Eight hours a day. How my water bill? One hundred thirty-seven dollars. St. Luke water bill. All those up there. I, I can imagine what their bill is. But see, they don't seem to care. They don't care about the programs that that you're trying to bring. I heard gentlemen, ladies talking about bringing the programs. I heard the young man was talking about the, how the, the kids go to school, get bit the other day, or uh, uh, the writer grant that we can get this. How, how to get this money? About the different things about how these kids getting messed up out here. See, they don't care. But uh, I'm thankful for St. Luke Life Center. Thank, Thank you. you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker is Ned Fellers. Mr. Fellers. Good evening, Council. Um, I have quite a few comments here. I realize I only have three minutes. Uh, kind of hard to know how to start this. I, I'd like to talk real briefly about some of the blighted commercial properties here in the Flint area and experiences and things I've learned in Detroit as Megan and her staff get ready to look at the next step after the master plan, and that's re rewriting the zoning framework. I, I really want to share this information with the steering committee also um, that will be working on the zoning things. And this is coming from 15 years of experience of working with industrial prospects with the city of Flint, getting them cited in intermediate uh, light and heavy manufacturing categories. Whether that category stays or not in the new zoning uh, plan, I do not know. It's also based on three separate contracts with the city of Detroit and commercial revitalization on the Van Dyke Seven Mile Road area and 15 years on the County Brownfield Authority. I hope as we look forward in the new zoning situation that we take notice of the following things. Listen to this comment. Many buildings in Flint are not short-term vacancies or problems between leases. Many buildings are strictly unleasable in their current condition. Typically, we see the properties to be bank-owned, land bank-owned, or absentee owners altogether. Another issue people never think about with the commercial properties, blighted commercial properties, the owner may be deceased and they have multiple heirs that are arguing over who owns the property. Those, those things can 
be very detrimental in getting a commercial building, um, a, a, a prospect into a building. Many require a significant investment in time and money before they can be occupied. The original commercial use no longer makes economic sense in that particular area for any number of reasons. Three variables that Mr. define Ford, effects on rehab or redevelopment of any blighted commercial Ned, property. Would you sum up, please? Your yes, three I minutes can. Are up. Acquisition costs, redevelopment costs, and income from a property. And I can go into more detail what people would like to know. All I'm saying is I hope as we look at the new zoning rules and regulations that we look at some of these things behind the scenes. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Next speaker is Mr. A.C. Dumas. Mr. Dumas. Good evening, A.C. Good evening. My name is A.C. Dumas, and uh, I want to say to those that voted for the emergency manager, uh, seven-point transition management team, Ms. Poplar, Mr. Nolan, Mr. Freeman, Mr. Kincaid, and Ms. Galloway. Since you did know what- Not Ms. Galloway. Uh, not uh, Ms. Uh, I apologize, Ms. Uh, Van Buren. I apologize, Ms. Galloway. That's okay. But since you didn't know, I guess you found out tonight what the deficit elimination plan is. Street lights increase. Water rates increase. Garbage pickup increase. 70 police and firefighters losing their jobs. Uh, blight potholes fix decrease. That's what you voted for because you didn't know the plan. Well, he gave you the plan tonight, and that's just the tip of the iceberg. Now the citizens, as uh, Councilman Davis has said, they're leaving the city of Flint like rats out of a burning building. I think uh, had you all been to the ACLU's uh, meeting that uh, the lawyer from the uh, sugar uh, law firm was there and others there, Pontiac City Council members were there uh, all over that went to a transition plan. And they said, do not believe anything that comes from emergency manager. Don't sit up here, Ms. Uh, Ms. Van Buren, and crying now. Mr. Nolan, 50 people from your ward, including me, called you. Ms. Papa, don't sit up here crying and showing Mr. Kincaid some passion. We're getting ready to lose everything we have. And you all are supposed to be Democrats. I know you're running for different. I know you want to go to the county now, Mr. Uh, Nolan. I know you abandoned the third ward. It's terrible. Now you want to go over to the county. Seems that's the boards you sit on. It's terrible. And the people ought to know. You voted for it, Ms. Van Buren. Don't cry. We tried to ask you. Don't vote for it. But now the citizens. Mr. Freeman, I'm going to wink my eye too. The citizens, we're going to pay for it. The retirees going to pay for it. And when you lose the lawsuit, you're going to end up in bankruptcy anyway. That, that's the bottom line. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Dumas. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Mr. Chris Del Moroni. Mr. Del Moroni. Thank you. My name is Chris Del Moroni, and I live in Flint, Michigan. Well, new budget. Five words sum it up, folks. Those who stay will pay. Those who stay will pay, without a question. You're going to raise the income tax. They want to increase that. Light increase, water and sewer increase, garbage increase, many of the things that were just said. Police and fire decrease in the services. And then what are we going to do on the other end? I mean, as long as we're decreasing something, I guess we can increase something. So, and, and some of these things are important to have, but we just need to figure out our priorities in this community. Uh, so what are we going to increase? Well, we're going to increase planning. We're going to keep planners here. We're going to increase council pay. We're going to increase the mayor's pay. We're going to put on a city administrator. How in the hell can you go out to the community and say, we're going to cut fire and police, but hire a city administrator? We've already got a mayor. 
We already got a city man, uh, uh, financial manager, emergency manager. We already got nine council people. Now we want a city administrator too? Give the people a break. Now the mayor, in his finite wisdom, he said, I think I got his quote here, the alarm bell is going off. Mr. Mayor, where in the hell you been? The alarm bell's been going off before you even arrived here. I mean, seriously. Now, we won't bankrupt the city on this budget. We'll just bankrupt the people, the ones that stay. Those who stay will pay. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Paul Herring, Mr. Paul Herring. Good evening, Council. You guys are missing the good points here, the, the, the good part of this. For two years now, you haven't been responsible for this mess. This budget isn't yours and never will be. I have a prediction. I have a prediction. Every change you make in this budget is going to be vetoed. That's prediction one. I have another prediction. You guys, unanimously, minus maybe two, are going to vote to accept the budget. And they're going to put blood on your hands. We need to be smarter than this, guys. We need to be smarter than this. Three years ago, we had a $4 million deficit, basically unpaid taxes. The state comes, takes $4 million plus from us in revenue sharing. We have a $9 million deficit. We get an emergency manager. Two years in, with an emergency manager, we have a $19 million deficit. And here we sit. We worry about public safety. I recommend we put a, a, a moratorium on talking about police. The community should not know the true numbers of police officers that are out there. Mm. You're sitting here telling the criminals we got two police officers. We got five firefighters. Come on. Go into an executive session. Do what you got to do in private. I think I'll be okay with that. You guys have an opportunity here. Mr. Neely, I suggest you go sit in your office, collect your $215, and be done with it. Brother Mays, you need to do the same. That's what your value is to the emergency manager. He doesn't want you here voting. He doesn't want your comments. He doesn't want our comments. He wants to dog and pony show all his decisions and make you sign in on them. He wants to put blood on your hands. You have to decide whether you're going to allow him to do that. Don't vote for this budget. Don't waste your time trying to get into committee meetings making changes. Let's see where it goes. Any CEO in America would be fired if he brought in a deficit after two years. There's nobody that can run a corporation anywhere that would be tolerated in that position. He has not shown us any income revenue generation. All he's talked about is cutting. He sold $100,000 garbage trucks to Republic and then gave them the contract to do the city. In all things purely Paul, social, Paul, wrap up, we can please. be as separate as the fingers. But y'all, we got to be blood free. And one is the hand in all things mutual, Thank beneficial you. to our mutual progress. Thank you. Our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our next speaker, and I hope I have the correct name pronounced right, Hollendike, Mr. Phil Hollendike? Hogendike. Okay. <laughs> Evening, Council. Uh, my name is Phil Hogendike. I represent Bruised But Not Broken Canine Rescue. Uh, we're a 501c3 nonprofit. Uh, we operate out of Grand Blanc, but uh, our sole purpose uh, and mission is to take uh, abused, neglected, and stray dogs off the streets of Flint. We rehabilitate them uh, out of our own pockets and put them in family homes. Um, Sheldon uh, contact, I actually contacted Sheldon when this was first talked about. He told me the story about the, uh, 
the young girl that was uh, attacked by a pit bull um, and her face was nearly ripped off. Uh, there's, a, there's a problem in this city with uh, the dogs. People choose to ignore it. Um, but if you drive around and get a good look in all, every one of your wards, I could show you places where there's a lot of bad things going on. And uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy that uh, uh, we were able, as a, as a group effort, um, Sheldon, myself, and uh, attorney Richard Angelo, who's devoted his law practice to defending animals, um, we were able to sit down and come up with a, with a joint partnership agreement um, for this legislation. And uh, I think that, that uh, it's really important to hold owners responsible. Uh, the simplest way I can put it, and how I tell people all the time, is that uh, children aren't born to hate. Their parents teach them to hate. Dogs aren't born to eat people or attack people. They want your attention. They want your love. Uh, people teach them. And it's actually in my experience with the dogs that we've pulled out of Flint, about 150 of them that we've rehomed in the last four years. And these aren't people's dogs that they've given to us. These are dogs that we've tracked down that are strays, that are feral, um, and that are on the loose and uh, place them all in homes and they successfully live there. But uh, um, it's, it's, it's a problem. Something needs to be done and uh, uh, people need to be responsible for their animals. Uh, it's a huge problem here. So I hope you guys take that all into consideration and uh, know that, that my organization fully supports that. Although we are outside of Flint, we're just down the road and uh, uh, we're committed to help with this problem. So, thank you. Thank you. Okay, our next speaker, Madam Clerk. Our last speaker is Mr. James Moore. Mr. Moore. Mr. Moore. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to come before you. Um, on the right hand, I have one situation. On the left hand, I have another. Basically, I look at it as H-E-L-P, help. Uh, most of the council members know that I've been here trying to create some jobs in the, in the area, trying to bring some industry back here to Flint. And I appreciate them giving me that time to be able to talk to them to try to help me to try to get this done. But a new situation that I have on the left, and I'm thankful that they let the people come up here and speak at the podium because I might have already found my answer from the city of Grand Blank. But I got a pet bull in my mother and my, my father's in the backyard that somebody done put back there and I go back there to clean the limbs from an ice storm that y'all had here, and there's a, there's a dog back there that's pretty, pretty big size. I, I feed him Kentucky Fried Chicken. I'm trying to make friends with him. I don't know who left him back there, and maybe he's doing me a community service on being back there. I'm really not quite sure, but I don't want to kill the dog, and I really don't know what to do. And since y'all going to be leaving, losing police and firemen, you probably already lost your dog control. I'm really not sure. But I'm just at that point. I just really don't know what to do. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. That concludes our speakers for this evening. Uh, council members, uh, time for comments. Co Councilman Mays, I'll start with you. Yeah, I would like to say to the public, I apologize for the emergency managers and my colleagues shutting you down at three minutes. I'm also apologizing for the rules put on by mainly my colleagues more than the emergency manager and they can correct me if I'm wrong but we used to could respond to you sister when y'all speak we used to could respond and that's something that I want to be the president for that's something that I wanted to be a councilman for I wanted to treat you guys just like the big timers they come in here they take up an hour they say and do what they want, and then when we get ready to vote, we come into y'all, the people, a certain way. These guys don't even vote for us, and they treat them a certain way. I asked the emergency manager in a closed-door meeting, I said, if I'm going to look at the quality of water, and if I'm going to believe y'all on these budget figures, unlike the council of the past, the charter say I can ask y'all under oath. Under oath in a public meeting, because if you go under oath, you, I know you're giving me good information before I vote. We've seen information change in three months, and we didn't vote it on. This council do not put in the time. If we want to do budget, we should be here at 8 in the morning, break for lunch and be back at five. It's appalling what we do. 
I can't be a part of not doing my job. I can't be a part of a public display when we don't treat each other right and know Robert's rules just as an elementary thing. So I'm responding to y'all when I come and walk around. I love your program. I'm all about economics, entrepreneurship, and jobs. That's what I knock doors for. That's what I campaign for. It's about 30 to 40,000 people in this community who need checks. When they get checks, they buy houses, we get property tax and income tax. Nothing in this budget talks about that. That's what I'm about. These people won't run me off this council. They can arrest me, they can talk about me, but Eric Mays has been voted in by some people on the far north end, black, white, young and old, the least of them. Proverbs 3rd chapter 5th and 6th verse. Trust in God with all thine heart. Lean not to thy own understanding. Acknowledge him in all thy ways, even on this council seat, and he shall direct thy path. God bless you. Stay tuned. It'll make sense. It'll make a whole lot of sense. I'll do my job. And my job is to look out for the least of them because when you help the least of them, those other people will cherish. This council can change that budget. They act like this is it. Paul Heron had it right. Let's see what our budget look like if they're willing to meet the long hours. I'll do my job. I'll make proposals if they're willing to hear them. Five votes will show you what a budget should look like. Thank you, Councilwoman Poplar. Thank you, Mr. President. First of all, I want to thank uh, Sister Judy and Sister Carol for all that you do at St. Luke's. And I hope that the community will come and take a look. Um, I hate and it grieves my heart that you did have a project that was going to happen to put you in a brand new building, and it fell through. And we were all uplifted when we heard it, and we all fell down when we didn't hear it anymore. But uh, we're still going to keep praying and staying, and I do believe that somehow uh, Mr. Phil Schultz is going to make a way for you guys to get a building. So he hasn't forgotten you. I talked to Phil, and he, he's, he hasn't forgotten you. And then the second thing, I want to, if there is anyone that can volunteer, please do whatever you can for the St. Luke's New Life Center. It, it has, I can't begin to tell you what it has done for the second ward and the constituents that live in the second ward. You have no clue, this city has no clue what a gem St. Luke's has been. And it started from these two ladies right here, these two nuns, started on a street corner. They started on a street corner with little or nothing. Amen. And now they're feeding the needy, clothing the needy, the hospitals are buying sh uh, scrubs from them. Not only hospitals in the city of Flint, the doctor's offices, but hospitals in Lapeer. And this thing, before it ends, it will be global. And it started right here in the city of Flint in the second ward. So we're going to keep St. Luke's moving and do whatever we can. My last thing. I want to thank all of the volunteers that came out for Flint Park Lake cleanup on Saturday. We cleaned up the, up the pavilion, and my my my, we found some strange little things, but that's okay. Um, that's what happens in the city of Flint. And once again, Megan, love you to death. But in that budget, with the grant dollars, you got to do something. And this council's got to do something for New Life Center. If not, 
Shame on us. I mean shame. So I'm, I'm ready to do what we need to do to keep it moving. But thank you. Thank you, Jackie. Um, Councilman Nolan. Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, one, I want to um, set the record straight. Um, I had 46 calls related to the um, um, seven-point plan, but only two people were from the third ward. And I couldn't take the one call because I was at work, so he texted me, and I was that gentleman there. The other folks, the other, that gentleman right there. Um, also, too, um, um, when it comes to working in my community, I, anybody that knows me knows that I do things in the neighborhood. I clean up. I cut grass. I do a lot of things. Um, in the morning, when I go to work, I ride through my ward. And when I ride through my ward, I ride past uh, A.C. Dumas' house. He's never there in the morning, so I don't think he really lives in the third ward, but that's beside the point. Um, the other thing is, yes, I am thinking of, or yes, I am a candidate to possibly run for and win the seat across the street. If I do win the first district um, county commissioner's race over there to try, if, I, if I'm successful, I'm going over there to try to help the north end of Flint because the first, second, and third ward is in very bad shape. With that, I'll pass. Thank you. Councilman Freeman? Yeah. Um, when I was young, under the age of 18, I was very, uh, I was pretty ambitious and I wanted to do a lot of things and spent a lot of time with my grandparents and my grandma, you know, she tried to calm me down a little bit and say, you know, you don't need to do that right now. You got time, you got time. And I'd always reply back, you know, when I'm 18 and I'm out on my own, I'm going to do this or, you know, I'm going to do that. And uh, when it was my 18th birthday, my uh, grandma called me up and she says, well, you're 18 now. Uh, what are you going to? And that's kind of like this conversation we have at every uh, council meeting. Well, when the emergency manager's gone, we're going to do this. And when the emergency manager's gone, uh, we're going to do that. Emergency manager leaves tomorrow. We've still got a uh, pretty significant structural deficit um, in the general fund, which our police and fire are paid out of. One out of every three dollars that comes in is going to go to retirees, pension, and health care. Thirty percent before one service is offered, one dollar is gone uh, before one service is offered. So we can sit back and, and um, complain about our current situation, or as Mr. Herring says, you know, don't put blood on our hands, and that's fine. But if we're in 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 power, if we are controlling the reins doesn't change the fact that, you know, we have X amount of dollars coming in and we've got to try to offer, you know, Y amount of services within those dollars. And Mr. Dumas is right. If we lose the lawsuit uh, with the retirees and things have to remain the same, you're probably right. Bankruptcy will be our, our um, answer. Um, because if you look out over two years, uh, what we're paying 30% today um, at $16 million for retiree pension and health care, um, in, in 2016 is going to be 32 percent and 17 and a half, almost 18 million dollars, and it just keeps going up and up and up. So maybe the answer is right, Mr. Dumas. Maybe we do um, just give up on that lawsuit and we should go and ask the governor um, to declare bankruptcy in the city of Flint because our number one creditor in the city of Flint are retirees, and they're the ones who are going to be most affected by that bankruptcy. So I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to, and we can keep saying what we're going to do. But at some point, um, we all have to be adults in the room and say, um, denying that the emergency manager exists doesn't make him go away. Uh, and we can work within that structure and try to uh, get things done for the 10 or 12,000 residents that I represent. Or I can sit and poke the guy in the eye and um, get nothing done. And I, you know, I've I've not always agreed with what the emergency manager has done. I've voted or I've testified in hearings against the emergency manager. I voted on a resolution and against P PA4. And when I went to the ballot box, I voted against PA4 um, because I don't think uh, the intent of that law has really come uh, to frui fruition. I think that we've had some emergency managers uh, before Mr. Early that um, I really don't know what their agenda was. They were kind of all over the place. Uh, but at least, at least under this emergency manager, um, he's kind of uh, 
uh, I don't know that he's transparent. I'm just saying I think that he's at least put some goals in place and given us something to work towards. So, um, you know, we can keep going each meeting and talk about what we're going to do, or we can try to be part of the process and uh, move the city forward. So that's all I got tonight. Thank you, Councilman Freeman. Councilman Davis. First, I'd like to thank the residents of this city for coming out and spending your, your quality time through this long time listening to us and, and, and making your comments. My problem I have is these people come in from Lansing and make decisions on how we should run our city. None of the things that we do in this city affects them. They get back on the expressway and go home. And that bothers me. When Woodrow Stanley came out of office, we had a $30 million deficit. Emergency manager didn't bring us out of that deficit. Council did. I got a little understanding of it, a little education of it, but I know council brought us out of that deficit. If the emergency manager left today, we'd get ourselves out this deficit. For one, I don't think that we approve cutting police and fire. That is a prerequisite for safetyness and moving our city forward and bringing businesses in. Businesses don't want to come if there is no safety net here. I do not agree with high water rates. The reason why our water rates is going to go up, from my understanding of it, that nobody is saying, is that when we was getting the water from Detroit, we were selling it to our neighboring counties. We were generating good money, good revenue. That was ba basically, uh, that was our cash cow. No longer is the county going to be distributed water from us. We're not going to be distributing water to the county anymore. The county is making a contract with Detroit and getting water from Lake Huron, which means we lose that revenue. It don't take a GED or a master scientist to realize that if we lose that revenue, somebody is going to have to take up the backslide, and it's going to be the residents of this city. I'm going to continue to stand on my argument that we have money that we owe to ourselves. From my last study, it was $10 million. We do not have to pay it back in five years. We can pay that back in 20 to 25 years and have a savings. And with that savings, it can be given back to the citizens and we can lower the water rates. Raising the water rates is a genocide to the people. Cutting police and fire department is a genocide to the people. Because the emergency manager, Jerry Ambrose, none of them have to live up under the chaos and the mayhem that's going to be created through this. I believe what Paul Hearing said, that we shouldn't give the numbers out to the residents of how many offices we're going to have. That doesn't do anything but entice and provoke more chaos and mayhem. It tells people if we got 30, 40 people, if we got 20, 30 people in an organization, in an organized crime fling, I can send 20 people over here, 10 people over here, how are they going to be able to get us? Somebody's going to be a victim of our acts. So I don't believe that we should do that. But however, I also, and, and, and audience can say what they want, but I also believe what Scott said, that this is a failed policy from Rick Snyder that we held in this. We supposed to have got some share, revenue sharing that was never given to us. If we was given that revenue sharing, we wouldn't be placed under the conditions that we are placed in. This governor has crippled, he has vandalized our communities, and he has treated us all, even the poor, like Eric says, the least of us, he has treated us as subhumans. And nobody that he sends to our city is going to go contrary to his sentiment and his feelings that he has towards Flint, Detroit, Pontiac, and every other city where he's put these emergency managers at. I also can relate to what my colleague Councilman Shelton said. They should share the sacrifice. You get $7,000 every two weeks. You give us $200. I'm going to end. I am, Mr. Uh, Councilman uh, Kincaid, President. They should, share, they should share the sacrifice. They walked out of here and didn't listen to none of y'all. And by Wednesday, which is tomorrow, they're going to have a big paycheck. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Davis. Councilman Neely. Yes. I, I do want to share... Um, sentiments of my, my council colleague, Jackie Poplar. I do support St. Luke's and I appreciate the opportunities 
that you give the people in that neighborhood. I know you had the Champions program there, and you've always been uh, open to the community, and I appreciate that, and I do support your efforts, and I will support you in trying to get them the necessary funding to continue to operate. Also, a, a, a noteworthy thing happened today. Uh, the emergency manager law is being challenged in the federal court currently. At 10 o'clock this morning, uh, the judge heard arguments this morning about the emergency manager law that's been afflicted upon the state of Michigan. Uh, there has not been any determination yet from that, those arguments, but that is ongoing. And hopefully, hopefully and prayerfully, uh, the judge will see it the way of the people, the way of the people. It has been a systematically deconstruction of the city of Flint. The emergency manager law is nothing more than a wrecking ball for Rick Snyder for urban centers throughout the state of Michigan. Even if we got control back today, even if we got control back today, they have systematically deconstructed some of our major assets in this community, and I just enumerated just a few. Our garbage trucks were sold. We'll never be able to afford to purchase those brand new Peterbilts as we did about seven years ago, Scott. Um, Genesee Towers has been blown up, and they use $880,000 of CDBG dollars to do that as well. We'll never get that back. The armory was given away for a dollar, if I remember correctly. A yeah. dollar. The armory was given away for a dollar. All of our assets inside City Hall, all of our lawnmowers, chainsaws, and other things that, that was down in our storage were, was auctioned off. We don't even have an account of how many things was, were auctioned off. It became an embarrassment because Mike Brown was a part of the process of auctioning all those things off. When Ed Kurtz took over, the grass in front of City Hall was growing up. Ed asked for somebody to go cut the grass. They said, we would love to, but you sold the lawnmower. The DDA had to come down here and cut the grass in front of City Hall. In this particular budget, we're buying chainsaws and lawnmowers now. That's your money. They even sold Santa Claus. Remember Santa Claus? They auctioned off Santa Claus. And even with these emergency managers, when I made the statement earlier, they put people in high-ranking positions to manage departments in, this, in the city that had, did not have the adequate skill set. Nepotism took place. We have people in operations right now, good people, but they did not have the skill set to move this community forward. But they're getting paid a lot of money. Up on Mike Brown exiting his second time as emergency manager, not the first time as emergency manager and not the first time as mayor. He gave all of these individual raises on his way out. At the same time he was laying people off in the customer service division in water, they were putting new carpet and new furniture over in, what department was that? They were, they, department of Community and Economic Development Area, I believe. Yeah, over, they, in, in the, over in the basement in the South Building. Right. They were putting, laying people off on one hand and putting new carpet and furniture in another place. Police officers took concessions and they put their life down every day for us. They, they fight to protect us and they're under attack right now. So I'm going to ask everybody not only on this council, but every resident to stand up for police officers and firefighters. It's time to unite around them because they protect us, we need to protect them. As we move forward as a community together, this exercise of the emergency manager will be over soon. But they have deconstructed us, but it's, it's the, now is the time that says no more. We give up no more. We will not allow you to take any more. He even took two minutes away from public speakers. So he needs to spend more time on figuring out how to generate revenue beyond tax, raising taxes, and less time writing uh, emergency manager rules to silence council people and handcuff the public. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Councilman Neely, I'd like to add one department that he demolished. Point of order, could you wait till your five minutes come? I'll wait till my time. Thank you. Council, Councilperson Galloway. Thank you, sir. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to my colleague, um, Joshua Freeman, for um, making note of page 23. I'll get with you on that. Um, what, I, what I hope will come from this um, council team is there appear, appears to be an undertone of sarcasm 
and con condescending statements. And with that, I mean that although there's a lot of frustration with the situation that we find ourselves in, I think that there should never be a decrease in professionalism in the way that one, our body language is, when one of our colleagues are talking, there's just a way that when you work in the professional arena that you carry yourself. One of the things that um, I share on the board with my council person, Joshua Freeman, and um, he made the statement that, you know, if the emergency manager was gone tomorrow, we still have um, decisions that have to be made. And he is absolutely right. Are we in a position to necessarily take over? I can't say that maybe we are, but, and Joshua Freeman and Juan Twez Davis are witnesses. In our meeting, the finance committee meeting, we were constantly told that the reason why we are in the situation we are in today is because those in leadership positions continued to make bad decisions. Was that not said? And so with that, I think it is disturbing to hear that maybe even the hint of frustration that we share, even though we know we need a plan, that we would voice our concern about it and, and someone would have the undertone that maybe we should not feel the way that we feel. In the long run, you have to go with the plan. But again, when you have been told, because you can only be told by those that are making decisions, that there has constantly been poor decisions made. There has constantly been mismanagement of funds. And yet, when you find yourself today, three years later, in a situation where have we really moved? And I guess I question, I know that the legacy cost is a great cost, and I'm a new council person, so I don't show, share the experience of most of my colleagues on this panel. But what I can say is, when we continue to be in deficit, when we go into a finance meeting and are told that every dollar has pretty much been accountable for, and then we come into a water study rate in which those presenting the water study share that the reason why you see an increase in the funds is because by 2019, the $9 million that the general fund owes the water fund should be paid back. That's alarming because to me, and maybe you heard it, Josh, and we were in that meeting, and I look to you for guidance because you know better than I know, and you know that I asked specifically, has every dollar been accounted for? And never once was it told that this account owes this account money. Because to me, that means that there's still a $12 million deficit. And I know that there's that receivable that says that the money is there, but like you said with the emergency manager, if we called an account for all monies to be reconciled today, those funds wouldn't be there. So in essence, although on paper it appears that it's there, it's not there. And so that to me speaks to a deficit still. I'm still learning but I'm still concerned. And so please, for those of you that really do know the power of prayer, we don't only need prayer because the Bible says faith without works is dead. We need those in leadership to begin now to make the right choices and decisions where the money is concerned. Thank you for that. Thank you, Councilperson Galloway. Councilperson Van Buren. Yes, thank you. First, I'd like to say thank you to the representatives that are here from St. Luke's and their program. Um, I think it's amazing that it was through your heart and through the need of the community and the people that came to you that needed the help that you have been so successful. I would love to at some time visit your uh, business. Uh, to me, I think it would be an inspiration to anyone to come and see that things are possible. And it started with a few people and has now grown to be the size that it is, and hopefully it will grow more. Uh, so I, don't, I want you to know that uh, we appreciate uh, what you are doing there, and um, hopefully they'll be uh, more duplicated throughout our city. Uh, 
What I'd like to also mention, and I noticed it was not mentioned at all tonight, is there's going to be some public forums for, presented by the Blue Ribbon Committee that we have heard so much about that they've been meeting basically in private. Now it's going to be presented to the public what they have come up for possible changes to the structure of the city of Flint. Now this was just released in a news release as of yesterday, so I don't know how many even know that there's a workshop this Saturday. The first one will be 10 o'clock at Mount Calvary on uh, North Saginaw. Then after that, it will be uh, May 10th and also May 15th. But I'm asking for you and others to attend because if we don't have a good attendance, they're going to assume no one cares and maybe put through something that we do not want. And the only way they're going to know is there has to be some opinions voice. Uh, they are asking residents on their opinions, ideas on how to improve the delivery of service, how to stabilize financial management, and how to increase accountability of elected and appointed officials. This is the same thing that happens when we ask voters to come out and vote. And with the small percentage that comes out, you know, how can you expect change? And then everyone puts pressure on what has happened or who's in those positions. They need to come out and speak. That way you're making a difference in what happens in the city. So again, please, and attend the Blue Ribbon Committee. It says you, you may only need to attend one, but if I were you, I'd go to all three just to make sure what the presentations are and what the city residents are saying. So I look forward to seeing you at those meetings. Uh, I guess if, uh, I hope this is in the paper. I don't know how they're getting the information out. But again, the first one is this Saturday, 10 o'clock, Mount Cavalry. Thank you. Amen. Thank you. P point of information, um, um, Mr. President, I sent an email out to you guys on Friday with that and also sent it out to um, um, AC Dumas and a few other, about maybe about 45 or 50 other people as well. I sent that out on Friday when I received it. So I wanted to make right. sure that you no, guys checked I, in. I appreciate it. Okay. It, but the formal public release isn't yeah. dated until yesterday. Today. Yeah. So it's like, but I, I wanted uh, to make if sure they really out. wanted people out there. Wouldn't they have given you better notice? Okay. Thank you. Th thank you. Co Councilman Neely, as I was saying earlier, there's one department that uh, Mike Brown demolished, and that was the demolition department that really had a positive impact on our community. We had two demolition crews that were going out doing demolition. They were tearing you know, anywhere from four to six houses a week down in our community. and. Um, not only did he get rid of the people, but he got rid of the equipment and the trucks and everything like that. So, you know, the emergency manager has really done a lot of demolition in, in the Point of order. Is that part of your five minutes? Yes, it is. Okay. And um, with no further business um, before the council. Could I mention something? Count Inez? Yes. Uh, to kind of piggyback on the statement regarding the Blue Ribbon Committee, I also sent an email to council members this afternoon as right. a result of what I received from the emergency manager's office regarding the Blue Ribbon Committee and trying to encourage uh, council members uh, to attend and participate and also to get the information out. The other thing that I wanted to indicate also is that uh, St. Luke's Parish and the church is one of our polling sites. And to, uh, to both sisters who are here, we greatly appreciate all that you all do to help us on election day with the cleanup and also allowing us to use the facility. We greatly appreciate all that you do to help us. Thank you so much. Mr. Thank, President, thank you. I wasn't trying to be funny and interrupt you. I didn't know you was in your five minutes. I appreciate you deviating from that stringent agenda and letting Ms. Um, Brown speak. But now can I say this? I want people to really understand that the revenue sharing, the income tax increase, entrepreneurship at home. They do um, the gowns. I've talked about bottled water. When we generate revenue, that's when 
we fix the city. It ain't about all these cuts. So in a real sense, entrepreneurship, revenue sharing, um, income tax increases, all of the revenue. If you hear the leaders talk revenue, they on the right track. If you hear them talk cuts and doom and gloom about what they see, they ain't on the right track. God bless you. Thank you. We're adjourned. Move to adjourn.